So crowns I don't do. I don't do prostheses on implants. I leave this uh, treatment, which is very hard work to realize to my colleagues, but I'm here to provide the maximum bone and mucus support. And that's what we're going to try to see today in the aesthetic zone. So today we're going to look at bond appetite, the evolution of surgical techniques in aesthetic zones. Why the evolution of surgical techniques? Simply because we have evolved with this material over the last seven years. We have learned to know this material and to appreciate its biological and physical properties. We keep discovering every day, and it is true that in the professional literature and the professional papers, they very often write that there's still a lot to learn about calcium sulfate because there are many things we don't know. So we will evolve in our approach to surgical techniques in the aesthetic zones. The analysis, of course, we have to do it just like we did in the first session, but we have to add in the aesthetic zones some analyses that we did not do in other sectors, in other zones. With regards to soft tissues and the periodontium, we need to know which periodontium we're dealing with. If it's thin periodontium, like you can see here on the left-hand side with this young man, and we'll see the clinical case later on, or there's a thick periodontium, like in this young lady. And both cases require a different surgical attitude. And we will see this as we go along. There's also, in the context of soft tissues, the papillae. Today, in periodontal surgery, we have many different ways to try to restore the papillae. The surgical means are hard to realize and the results are also, shall we say, not a hundred percent. And we need to know what type of papillae we're dealing with. And as we will see, you have to manage and deal with the papillae in order to be able to conserve it. We'll see these two cases, one after the other. There's a extraction of this infected tooth. We'll see how infected it is. And in this young man who has a papilla that is very large, completely different from what you can see here on the left-hand side. The line of smile is also very important for this young lady. Clearly, we have to restore the papillae because when she smiles, she uncovers them. She exposes them, which is completely different to an old lady who does not uncover. Heart tissues, this is the bone, the osseous tissue, and this is the support of the soft tissue. Yes, that is true, but there's a big but. We have to be very careful when we're dealing with infected tissue. When you have a patient such as this one, who asks to get a, a larger aesthetic result with an implant and you see this, you think, okay, there's a papilla here, I'll try to restore it later, but careful. This volume of tissue, soft tissue, is not at all representative of the adjacent or underlying volume of bone, and you can see the proof right here. We have a bone deficiency, which is very large. So you have to be very careful. The bone, the heart tissue, usually, is underneath the gingiva, and the profile of the gingiva usually reflects the profile of the heart tissue, but when there is an infected zone, big danger. So in this case, for instance, and we'll see it later, we'll see what surgery we can do this with. There is no vestibular wall at all, and you can see the bone deficiency is huge and it was not uh, representative of the volume of the mucous uh, tissue before the operation. So we treated this with bond appetite and with a special type of surgery. We'll speak about it later. Uh, there's a release incision distal. We don't touch the papilla. 
And as you can see, we manage in fight of the bone deficiency, which reached all the way up here, we manage to restore the festoon to find the cervical line that aesthetically is going to be appreciated by the patient. So be careful about uh, heart tissues. Check on the x-ray the scope of the bone deficiency. And now with regards to the adjacent teeth, we have to take them into account as well. Here we have a crown. This tooth, as we will see, will have to be extracted and we will have to do an implant with an osseous filling up and we need a temporary prosthesis which has a lot of uh, impact on the aesthetic result and the shape of the soft tissues. So we will have to use a temporary prosthesis and try to avoid using a removable uh, temporary prosthesis. When there's a crown on one side, we'll see what to do in order to use a, an adequate temporary prosthesis which is stable and not removable. So the evolution of the surgical act, through various clinical cases, we shall see how we have evolved in the surgical act and the application of bond appetite in the aesthetic zones. This is what we used to do maybe seven years ago. Ever since I started to use bond appetite, I don't do this anymore. I do not do this simply because today you can realize this. And the advantages are enormous. You all know that in order to do such a surgery, which is invasive surgery, you have to do a large flap, which usually goes very high. You need to use two surgical sites and you harvest this graft in order to put it uh, on the other side. And then you have to expect a painful healing process and the risk of exposure. Economically speaking, it takes much more time in the uh, consultation room and you need to be an artist to do that. And I congratulate all my colleagues who managed to do this because it's really very hard to do. And also, economically speaking, the materials used, you have to use another uh, osseous filling uh, material. You have to fill here and here and use a membrane and you have to have the fixation screws and all that costs a lot of money. Today, in the 21st century, we can do a minimal surgery with only one release incision, not touch the papillae, which is not the case here, because in order and to restore it, it's not easy. But here, you don't need to touch the papillae. You uncover a bone deficiency, which is not lower than on the other side, but with bond appetite, you can reach a result. As you can see here, we'll see it as we go along. The same is true for this case. It's much easier to realize this with bond appetite and mainly in the times, in these times when we need to be less invasive, it's much easier to use bond appetite, as you can see on the right hand side, than to do a invasive and hard to realize surgery, as you can see on the left hand side, which is what we used to do in the past. So, we evolve in our surgery, and this is the case of a young lady. It's an old case. We're going to look at the cases we did a few years ago. This was done, I think, four or five years ago. And we'll reach cases that we are doing currently, even up to a few weeks ago. In this case, where you have a large height of keratinized uh, gingiva, but the festoon is very clearly seen here. And here with a periodontium that is thin and a fistula, which is found here, with a small surgery, which allows us to visualize the bone deficiency. You can see it here. There's actually no vestibular wall and there's a passage, uh, a vestibular 
vestibular palatal passage, so to fill here with classic surgical techniques, you would need to take two flaps, one palatal and another one vestibular, and then use membranes and also use other materials and fixation screws with much more invasive surgery. But here, when you see this, you're very happy because clearly you have a clot, a an osseous clot, which is wonderful. It's going to help you a lot. You have two septums here that are thick enough and large enough for us. The release incision here is three millimeters. That's what I did five years ago. I will see you that today I would have done this even less invasively, but here you have two uh, release incisions, uh, three millimeters from the bone deficiency. And when you apply bond appetite here, because of its uh, hardness, then you can actually maintain this scalloping here and you don't have any collapse of the papillae uh, because of the physical and biological properties of bond appetite. Physical, simply because it's a hard material and it uh, does not, uh, it prevents the infiltration of soft tissues inside, so there's, be, there's going to be less collapse. And also, it releases calcium to form hydro, hydroxyapatite, uh, i.e. calcium sulfate. And we will see the results here three months later with the temporary crown. And this brings us to an extraordinary scalloping, no uh, bone loss here. And the papillae are here. And you can see the reparation of the heart tissues look three months afterwards, what we have surrounding the head of the implant. And you could ask, what is this tissue here? Is it fibrous tissue? No, not at all, not at all. Because the soft tissue does not infiltrate uh, bond appetite and the best proof is that one year later see here the septum is completely calcified that's what was missing here in the bond appetite to continue the calcification of the bone which it replaced so look at the uh, osseous reparation here after one year which was really formidable and the neck of the implant is here and we'll see it several times this is the same thing here. This was with this patient, a female patient, six or seven years ago. She came with a periodontium, which is not bad all in all, because it's thick and a very high keratinized uh, gingiva, but terrible brushing. So here, as you can see, it's easy. You might say, I still have bone support that maintains the soft tissue or supports the soft tissue so there's not going to be any collapse. I won't have this very long tooth which is going to be completely different from the adjacent teeth but no not at all. It, there's a very big danger here. You can see it once you extract the tooth. There's a vestibular collapse of the soft tissue which is seen here in a total absence of the vestibular osseous lamina. What I do have here is the septum which remains here and another one here but they're very thin so don't count on catching up with this uh, bone deficiency around the segments of the roots here no not at all but you can maintain the same height and do again the vestibular lamina with bond appetite so the surgery here is the same as the access surgery that we seen we saw before. This was done six years ago. What we did here was a an incision on the collateral tooth, three mill millimeters from the bone deficiency, in order to reach after uh, having applied bond appetite. This result, we completely repaired the vestibular phase. Uh, this these are the septum. And here you can see the result six years later this scalloping. This is what we wanted to have. Again, I'm not referring to the prosthesis. I don't do any prostheses. Uh, the practitioners do that uh, the best they can. I am just referring to the preparation of the soft tissues and hard tissues, the bone or surrounding 
uh, to get six years later this result. The same is here in a case where the periodontium is completely different. This young man who came from Belgium to have an emergency treatment, when he came with an infected zone at the cervix of his number 11, when you see something like that, don't be surprised to find such a bone deficiency. This was done approximately three years ago. So we still had the same technique of surgical axis, which we discussed earlier, to release incisions with the visualization of the bone deficiency on site. Here, luckily, we have a large papilla associated with bond appetite. There will not be any bone collapse. And we will do an overfilling adding bond appetite also on top of the implant which was put on the same day there's a huge gap here as you can see and in these cases you don't see the implant here usually it's one to two millimeters underneath the septums and you have to fill all of that so you do overfilling of bond appetite and you close and this is the result of the, well, the scalloping that we managed to reach at the same level as whereas uh, previously what we had here was an infected zone which seemed to be the same level the same scalloping as the cervical limit but here yeah we managed to do that with by while keeping the papilla completely intact this is the occlusal view and he went back to Belgium to have his definitive crown done. He left uh, my office with a temporary crown. It's also interesting to see the healing of the uh, hard uh, tissues. When you put the healing band, you can see this is a radiolucent area, which could appear or leave some doubt as for the amount of heart tissue surrounding the implant this is what we can see here maybe three or three and a half months later but look at the x-ray 18 months later look at this bone which is the patient's bone very simply but maybe just a few crystals of hydroxyapatite that are found here but it's more than 90 percent the patient's bones that goes over the limit of the neck of the implant to provide this wonderful scalloping this is one year later so the process of conversion and transformation of bond appetite into bone is an evolutive developing process it continues it's progressive it continues over time uh, from the third month uh, to one year later so there's absolutely no concern when you see this after three months you just have to give it time give the bone time to calcify uh, based on the patient's turnover this is the first case that we saw this is more recent maybe uh, one and a half years ago he was sent to us to do an extraction of this number 21 and to prepare the soft and hard tissues for the future prosthesis and here it was the same thing on the same day of the extraction we put the implant it was feasible and you, we, you already know the conditions we can remind them afterwards if you need uh, we managed not to touch the central papilla but remember that we did have to have an implant here not just an osseous fitting up but also an implant we managed to limit ourselves to only one incision and here we didn't touch the papilla at all there it is we filled here with bond appetite and we uh, left the healing screw and he left and went to his practitioner with his temporary crown and look at this we managed to conserve the papilla both papilla the scalloping and the height of well the serve of the cervical height here it's the same look here you can see the healing of the hard tissues it's exactly what we previously saw it's 
simply here a radiolucent area which might have led us to believe that we are losing bone and there's a future periimplantitis maybe but no not at all look at this here this wonderful bone after one year and maybe a few months more that actually goes over the limit of the cervix of the or the neck of the implant which is right here this is a very uh, good uh, prognostic uh, sign for the future of the implant. So again, we simplify the surgical axis by using a single distal incision. This case was realized maybe four years ago. It is a school teacher who came in emergency in order to get uh, this root replaced this number 23 and we talked before about putting the implant on the same day but very often we have the root of the uh, canine which is which points in the vestibular direction so when it goes in a different direction from the tooth then you can think of an implant but look at the type of prosthesis that you're actually trying to do here if you want to realize a prosthesis which is screwed you will not be able to put your implant in this axis you will have to find an axis such as this one so necessarily you will have a dehiscence here if you use a bonded prosthesis then yes you can put the implant here in this axis and in that time, the practitioner did prosthesis that were bonded. So we kept this axis. And you can see the dehiscence here. You can see the level where we are, the amount of vestibular loss with regards to the septum of this uh, extraction, this uh, alveolus. So we put the implant on the same day with a temporary crown we close this flap like an envelope like so over the bond appetite while conserving naturally all the uh, protocol of uh, the application of bond appetite you have to press firmly for four or five seconds and uh, obtain a, a homogeneous material compact that adheres to the bone and then you reach this stage you can put the implant on the same day one week later look at the healing very beautiful healing the fix tracer this is three months later and this is four years later this is the x-ray again you can see the surrounding bone in the papillae and underneath which is really very impressive very beautiful four years later and this case we saw in our first session on the analysis of soft tissues this patient was sent to us referred to us to extract the canine after we realized two implants her canine which was carious underneath uh, the previous crown she was referred to us in order to try to restore here some hard and soft tissues that would allow us to create a canine that would not have the cervical limit so much higher than the future crown that was expected on her number 12. This would not be pretty, uh, aesthetically speaking, so we had to bring the soft tissue all over this uh, to fill this area with soft tissue. And believe you me, it's not easy. It's a very complicated challenge. So this is the tooth to be extracted we extracted it look at the yellow line here that indicates the difference in the cervical height between number 12 and the extraction site we applied bond appetite but here we have a major um, asset which is a septum and this septum is high we have another one here so by filling with bond appetite between these two septums we can avoid the collapse or prevent the collapse of this bony environment 
but the problem is how to bring the soft tissue over uh, to cover the bond appetite because there's no soft tissue we did not do surgery because we wanted to preserve at all cost the cervical limit of this uh, uh, implant zone and maybe possibly this uh, tooth which will receive a crown in the future so on the other hand we have four walls here and we applied uh, bond appetite but there's no soft tissue so what can we do very simply what we have to do here is to suture uh, a collagen sponge maybe two because this too we have to cover look how high we're located here it's terrible it's a very difficult challenge to realize and still today we have a support a hard support of bond appetite which allows us to suture and to get covered with one or even two collagen sponges this is uh, the provisional puris which is well a little bit rough but never mind it's it's put in place and it presses gently on the collagen sponge this is one and a half weeks afterwards look at where we are and this is the result that we obtained uh, after the bridge was done by uh, the, the doctor dr amal in this case who did this uh, prosthetic uh, realization and look at what we have in the end look at the cervical limit here of number 12 where you know previously we were almost here we managed to retrieve all of that to get all of that in keratinized gingiva so what happened here as we could see in our session number three how to cover bond appetite well the epithelial cells will simply go over the surface of the bond appetite underneath the collagen sponge and this keratinized gingiva here will be all over bond appetite since bond appetite does not allow like any other calcium sulfate the penetration of epithelial conjunctive cells into the material itself so into the substance so this conjunctive tissue will proliferate and close all of this and the result is very impressive so the same happens here in this case this is slightly different from what we saw before because you can see and this is a question that uh, dr eve asked he's asked me david how did you manage to do this challenge to recover all of that with soft tissue no it's not the same case as before because when we extracted the teeth look we had a bit of soft tissue underneath which was already there not in a very good situation but it was there just the same so here all we needed to do was a crystal incision slightly in the palatal direction and push all that uh, soft tissue put the implants and then use uh, or apply bond appetite this is on the other side we put the implants and then we put bond appetite on the vestibular side to get this uh, type of curve and look at what we obtained the same cervical limit as the other teeth well before that we were very much higher this is a case which was realized together with dr amos maybe two and a half years ago a young man came in to treat this tooth which hurt and there was a swelling here and this is what we saw because you know very often in the aesthetic zones you have to ask for what they're looking for and this is the uh, bone deficiency it's huge and if you don't treat that you're going to have a total collapse and the soft tissue is going to go up, up all the way to here at least so this is not something you want to do so you have to fill the other side is okay the patient decided for aesthetic reasons to extract also that tooth which was in a precarious situation on the other side so this is what we did this is the papilla which is present and here we wanted to see and we realized that we didn't have any vestibular lamina left here but look at here the height the vestibular height that we are left with it's very small we are here almost 
already at the labial frenum. So there's not much we can pull from. And all of that you have to take into consideration. We can't pull the flap much from here. So what we did was simply do an oblique incision, maybe one tooth away from the bone deficiency because that's a very large bone deficiency. And here we also verified that here there was a vestibular lamina that was missing, but less than the other side. So we decided to open. Today, one and a half or two years later, uh, I would not have done that. I would be content by just doing this incision over here. I wouldn't have opened all of that. Look at the size of the, the scope of the bone deficiency. Now, if we had to use conventional surgical techniques with the uh, osseous implants and all kinds of uh, vestibular lamina uh, harvested from the tibia or the iliac bone or the parietal bone, we would have required surgery that would have gone by far over this zone up to here. We would have had to gone to go all the way up here. And again, today, two years later, two years after this realization, today I would not have opened, I would have kept the pepola and only opened and incised here distally. So here we're going to analyze what we have here in terms of bone support. The papilla is large enough, which is good. Here we have a septum, another one here, which is very good. And with bond appetite, this is precisely what we need. So you apply bond appetite like as usual. I'm going over this uh, very fast. You press with your finger and then with your mold peeler, and then you do an overgrafting over here. You pull the flap, but when you pull with the flap, you pull to the maximum. There is no release incision here in the thickness, uh, in the beginning of the flap. You don't want that. You want a flap that is not connected to the muscle, so you need to keep the partial thickness here. And you're going to suture it and you're going to pull on it and it doesn't matter if it's not connected to the muscle because you can pull on it and you reach this. This is filled with bond appetite and it's going to transform into the patient's bone. We are now familiar enough with the material and we trust it. So this is what's going to happen. Now we only have to cover these two areas, these two zones, and this is where we need to use a collagen sponge in order to cover the two uh, sockets that are filled with the uh, bond appetite. This is what we obtain. The papilla is sutured as well, and we covered the bond appetite with these two collagen sponges, as you can see here. And we already know how to do that. So I did say that you should not use collagen sponges to cover bond appetite in a bone deficiency that has three walls you have to pull a flap. But sometimes, as I said, in the aesthetic zones, it's not the same. And that's true because when you don't have enough vestibular height as here, you cannot pull the flap to cover the entire um, area of bond appetite. So what you'll have to do is use a collagen span sponge to cover it. There's absolutely no concern here and you will see the healing process This is the temporary bridge which is going to be bonded and press on the collagen sponges. You can see the response here of the patient's bone which transforms the bond appetite. You can see all of that. All that didn't exist. We obtained maybe 0 0.8 millimeters up to one centimeter of bone in width. And that was in existence as well. So when you do an implant in such a situation, try to also take a minimum flap. Here, we did not take uh, touch the papilla here. We only used a small palatal flap here. We had enough thickness not to make a mistake here. In here, the patient goes back to have his definitive crown 
made by his practitioner and this is what we obtained the same scalloping that we had previously here with the previous crowns that he already had so in this case this is a woman who came to me 18 months ago she wanted to talk to us about her implant that which she had done a few years before and which kept becoming fistulated so it is true that with cbct you reach this it's not a very good situation not to mention the fact that there's no bone left surrounding this uh, adjacent root and there's a beginning of bone loss here so that's not easy to deal with because you don't have septums here anymore so you have to open and this is where we're at after having removed the, the implant now notice that here the root is not covered by bone anymore the bone should have reached here here it's the same there was bone loss and restoring bone here surrounding the roots forget it but what we can do is keep here fill all this and uh, restore an interesting vestibular face this is what we did we used bond appetite without membrane as usual we closed all that and this is what we have after one month so we don't have any loss of bone or uh, soft tissue that reaches here where i'm showing with the mouse cursor no not at all this is the result the aesthetic result obtained by the practitioner and the patient is very happy with this highly acceptable result and now a complicated case this case came with this central tooth which moves and which dropped and you can see here at the festoon this is slightly higher than the festoon of this number 21 we have a papilla which we will have to keep we shouldn't uh, use it she already has diastema if we don't uh, uh, restore the papilla then the gap is going to be much too big so we have to preserve this area and the best way to do this and to preserve the papilla is simply not to touch it at all you will notice that we don't have the bone thickness required to implant on same day or even later so we have to do a lateral uh, augmentation so after the extraction of the tooth we only did one incision distally in order to be able to visualize the place where we want to realize the lateral augmentation of the crest and we did not touch at all the papilla this is the endosteal preparation and then application of bond appetite and then we suture we there is absolutely no possibility of pulling a flap to close and cover all that because as you can see the height the vestibular height here is very big so you can't there's nothing you can pull and close to cover bond appetite so we use since we want soft tissue here we just use a collagen sponge and this is the temporary prosthesis that was installed it's removable i don't like them so much but we didn't have a choice and this uh, uh removable temporary prosthesis does not take account of the bone deficiency it doesn't press here it presses on the palate and here look you can see this lack of soft tissue which we need and which does not cover currently the bond appetite but the sponge the collagen sponge is here the epithelial cells will crawl over the bond appetite 
over here underneath the collagen sponge look at what is happening what we obtained with the heart tissue that's a very good lateral augmentation and here with the crown or with the removable device what we could re obtain in terms of the festoon the pepola and maybe even here beyond the scalloping I know she doesn't brush very well here. She will learn how to do that. But look at what we got here. I would like to remind you that here we did not have any soft tissue on all of this perif uh, peripheral area. And here she's going back to her practitioner to get her uh, crown done. Another case of a central tooth, that's one we saw in the beginning of the session. This young patient, about 25 years of age, she came because of a discolored tooth that is also moving and after CBCT we have to do that because it's an aesthetic zone this is what we got so forget about the possibility of extracting this tooth and using bond appetite directly through alveolar axis forget it you will never be able to find again or to restore the curve the osseous vestibular curve because it's really very hard to insert bond appetite all the way through so you have to open and that's what we did after the extraction we opened and then thanks to an oblique incision only here distally and that's that was one of uh, the questions asked by the practitioners two sessions ago yeah we didn't do a mesial incision in the aesthetic uh, zone but only distal look at the size of this bone deficiency this small very narrow bridge is going to help us a little, but mainly we did not touch the papilla, and that is very important because look here, this form of papilla, this shape of papilla, it is very thin, it could collapse very easily, it has very little bone support. So we used bond appetite, we closed, sutured, and covered thanks to a collagen sponge which is going to bring soft tissue on top of the bond appetite this is the same day and this is three months later with her temporary uh, prosthesis she doesn't have an implant yet by the way she never returned to get her implant so we have this bonded uh, palatal prosthesis which provides a wonderful festoon and allowed us to preserve central and lateral papilla this is another case A patient who came simply for a bridge, he has two crowns, two devitalized adjacent teeth here. So this is what we have. You can see there is no vestibular wall. There is communication with the cavity of the nose. It's an extremely complicated case. This is the result before. The practitioner prefer, prepared a temporary bridge to allow us to extract this tooth. But if there's a collapse here, it's a catastrophe. So we will have to fill. I did here something that you should not do. This was realized not long ago, maybe six months ago. And we extracted this tooth. We did some cure touch. There was a lot to remove, believe me. We were very careful not to enter the cavity of the nose. We didn't have any vestibular wall here, so I pushed bond appetite directly into the socket and pushed upwards. Why? Normally you don't do that. You should not do that. You have to open with an incision distally here, which is going to go over the gingival limit by three or four millimeters you have to deploy a flap and look at the bone deficiency and then insert bond appetite but in this case the patient actually came in to do a bridge so we only need to preserve the scalloping not to obtain a vestibular curve I have to maintain or to preserve this line so I took the liberty of taking bond appetite to 
condense it with a compress surrounding uh, a narrow tool like the handle of a mirror of a sound the handle yeah that pushes and compacts the bond appetite inside it was an experimental technique i ask you not to do that but here you can see that we also covered bond appetite with a collagen sponge because there was absolutely no surgical access here we also used an intraoral dressing to protect the collagen sponge this is on the same day he went away with his uh, provisional uh, device and and this is the result and believe me it's not easy i broke the uh, temporary bridge the practitioner i'm sure forgave me but we managed to keep the scalloping that allowed him to have a very beautiful and good looking definitive bridge and yes we didn't get a vestibular curve here but uh, we corrected that with dr kekon who came to work with us we opened here again to fill we thought of using a graft uh, a conjunctive uh, tissue graft but finally we only used bond appetite without touching the scalloping it was not compulsory but we did it well let's say just for fun anyway again this is a very particular case this was because we were supposed to do a bridge and not an implant otherwise we would have had to open with an incision here distally this incision should be at roughly the half or two-thirds of the collateral tooth the adjacent tooth uh, deploy a flap not touch this papilla this has to be conserved and preserved and then fill with bond appetite according to the protocol so this young man we talked about him in session number one he's about 20 years of age and he was hit by a surfboard in his face and he was sent to us for treatment he's young he has a thin periodontium. His scalloping is really marked with papillae that are thin. And you have to touch it as least as possible. In this case, when we removed this part, which was not too hard to remove, we succeeded in removing the second part thanks to an endodontic uh, file, which allowed us to preserve this vestibular wall. So here we have a bone deficiency, but still four walls, so we don't need to open. So we filled with bond appetite. After having applied bond appetite, we added a collagen sponge with an intraoral dressing to protect the sponge. This is one week later. You can see the intraoral dressing that becomes thinner and white. You can see the threads underneath and this is the result that we obtained it's a wonderful result it could have been a little bit better if the practitioner had opened a little bit more the papilla over here but this can be repaired and this is still a fantastic result which is not easy to realize and the biological and physical properties of bond appetite allowed us to use less surgery and cause less damage and still get this result. Now I would like us to watch a video together about a young man who's 25 years of age with internal uh, resorption on two centrals. As you will see here we have a bit of the root which is present on 11. There's a large infection, major bone deficiency as you can see and here you can see the other bit the other side of the root that will have to be removed this is the young man with of course brushing that is not the best in the world we extract as we can whatever needs to be extracted this is the incision distally one or two thirds of one tooth or two thirds of a tooth uh, away from the bone deficiency we create a flap trying not to touch the papilla 
we see how far we can cover with the flap, but there's no concern because we know we won't be able to cover everything. So we'll have to use a collagen sponge anyway. And now we need to remove this part of root, which is hard to remove, but we still manage to do it, as you can see over here. Look at this uh, bone deficiency. There's still a second bit here. There it is. There. So look at this. Look at this bone deficiency. Terrible. And also, this patient doesn't have any vestibular height. Look at this. So using a classical technique here with uh, bone harvesting is extremely difficult. In such cases, it's excessively difficult to realize. So all we need to do is apply bond appetite, apply it well, press firmly four or five seconds with your finger he here. I couldn't even use my finger so much. It was deep, so I had to use a mold peeler to push it in, as you can see. And then you add whatever you need to add. And here we also fill crestally. Remove the surplus. we see how far we can pull and cover the bond appetite and, and if uh, it's mobilized remove the bond appetite then we just compress it a little bit more again there's no problem with that and then you start mesially here to be able to make sure that you can close afterwards and we fill the, the socket of 11 which was infected and had been clean, but it still has four remaining osseous walls. Remove the surplus like so. And you can add some if you like. We did, but it wasn't very helpful, but okay. And here you can see that we have the same case that we saw before. And we are going to cover the bond appetite with a collagen sponge. This case was done maybe a year ago. Thanks to this collagen sponge, you allow the soft tissue to cover the bond appetite and bring the keratinized gingiva back here. And careful here, you don't have any vestibular wall left. So if you move the bond appetite too much, then you have to give it a push again to compress it. And here I'm being held by Dr. Amos Yahoo, whom I'd like to thank. And that's what we obtained. And believe me, the with regard to the predictability test, we see that nothing moved. It is not going to open up. He leaves the office with a bonded bridge. This is one week later after the bridge was the bridge was removed. And this is five days later, sorry. And this is ten days. And this is three months later, what we managed to obtain in terms of the bone tissues. You can see after the bone deficiency that we had, look what we have now. Look at that.
and the same here and here again this did not exist and again here on this side all that did not exist all that bone wasn't there and we were able to put our implants without touching the papilla naturally so this case which was a difficult case we managed to realize it thanks to a minimal surgery So this is the one before last case. I would like to share this case with you. It's very complicated because of various reasons. First, because the patient was referred to us to extract this tooth, which is a, an important tooth. And the proximity of the tooth with the implant, the cervical limit has to be preserved here. The papilla is almost non-existing here. Here you have a large papilla that still exists, which you have absolutely to preserve. So after the extraction, we decided to do an incision that doesn't touch the cervical limit here to preserve that part. And here we have a large vestibular bone deficiency. So naturally, you can see that the patient has no vestibules here. So we know that we will not be able to pull a flap, but we'll do whatever we can without trying to cover all of the bond appetite, which will close with the collagen sponge. What we can't cover with a flap, we'll do with the collagen sponge. Three months later, this is how he comes in, and I'm thinking, oh, something's not right here. Here, the papilla was preserved very well, good level, but here, there's something that's missing. And there's some bone support that's missing, and I really want to know why. So the patient left the office with a removable temporary prosthesis, and I asked him, did you make sure to only use it when you go out and all that? Because there's a problem here. And he admitted then that the prosthesis, the uh, temporary prosthesis broke after one week, and his practitioner created the second one for him. This is why I understood that this happened because this was not released here. When you have a temporary prosthesis, you have to make sure that it does not compress this part every time that he's eating. It keeps pressing and pressing and pressing and compressing the bone's appetite, thus preventing the formation of bone. So I thought it's not too bad. Let's just put the implant. And this is what we couldn't obtain here, although we have a wonderful bone on this side, but here there's something missing. So we just added some bone appetite on the day uh, we put the implant. And this is what we had in the end. We had the festoon, the papilla, the scalloping, and this keratinized uh, gingiva here, and the papilla here that's preserved. And this is the prosthesis created by his practitioner. And this is how it looks after three months. This is the bone that is going to keep getting calcified and providing an excellent result. So this is a, an extreme case. It's our last case. But we're not going to look at it today. We're going to see it in a future session dealing with the major bone deficiencies. Here you can see that there is no wall, no palatal, no vestibular wall, and still we manage to obtain such a result, this result, and in the next session I will show you how. It's not the next session, the next session is going to be about bone appetite and implants, which means when you put an implant, how to use bone appetite to cover a dehiscence how to use bone appetite to close a gap and how not to use it also we'll deal with the cases when you better not put the implant on the same day but just apply bone appetite reconstruct the bone and then put the implant later this is the result